Um, but before we get to the uh, to uh, several of the other speakers, um, it is going to be my honor to introduce our keynote uh, perfusion speaker for this year. And uh, and and like so many individuals before him, there's this little that you can do to um, inform others of what uh, Jeff Riley's contributions have been to the to the field of perfusion um, go in his fifth decade of uh, continuing to be a leader in our field. Um, I had the the privilege of working with Jeff. Um, at the Medical University of South Carolina many, many years ago. And, uh, and it was just an uh, incredible opportunity to see his, uh, his leadership abilities, his capacity, his, uh, his, his, his mind, which was always um, so far ahead of what the rest of us were, were thinking. Um, and, and as you all know, Jeff has been involved in the education realm for his entire career. Um, you go back and you look at a, a topic such as uh, the use of electronic medical records in our field, which uh, you know today, um, thank goodness, are, are finally extending probably above 50% in this country and near 100 in other countries. Um, and Jeff, really, if you search on his name, you'll see that he uh, he started publishing on this uh, back in the uh, early 1980s um, using a, a tandem and uh, and computers that he bought from Radio Shack. Um, but there's so much more that he has done throughout his his career, and he's influenced so many individuals um, who've uh, who've had him as a mentor. Um, over the many years uh, as a program director in South Carolina and Ohio State, um, his work at Midwestern University, uh, his leadership at the Mayo Clinic and, and other centers in Cleveland, um, and now as his, um, his continuing teaching realm at the uh, SUNY uh, education program in Syracuse, New York. So it is my, my pleasure to have Jeff as our keynote speaker today, and the, his title of his presentation is Perfusion Education, what, stu what a student experience today and what the future holds for them. Jeff Riley. Can you hear me, Al? Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, Al and I have been through a lot together and, uh, and have learned so much from each other and, uh, and appreciate uh, each other's contributions. Uh, I can almost say exactly verbatim what Al said about me, about him. Um, so I have three assignments today. I got three assignments from the, uh, from the committee uh, and I've tried to take those assignments literally uh, and not talk about what I wanted to talk about, but talked about what I think they wanted me to talk about. Uh, the first is what a student experiences today and what the, the future holds. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, I'm uh, an employee of Biomedical Simulations. Um, I'm one of the directors of AMSEC's uh, International Board of Blood Management, and I consult with uh, several folks, and, and including AMSEC University. So I have a lot of uh, bias in this area, and I'm going to try and fight those uh, biases and, and present uh, what I've heard from other people. Uh, two presentation goals. What does a profusion education student experience today? Uh, and then finally, what does the future hold? Um, there's probably nobody better to ask what a profusion education student experiences than uh, recent graduates um, of profusion education programs. Uh, and I tried to uh, get clever at first and, and try to come up with some kind of hook to uh, keep us engaged in the linear experience that a, that a profusion student has in school today uh, in, in their programs. Uh, I came up with these milestones or, or road, uh, roadmap uh, markers along the way. Uh, Pre-admission, enrollment, didactic, clinicals, all words that, that you certainly appreciate. Uh, I can't see the audience, but I imagine most of you graduated after 1980. So you probably came out of a, an accredited perfusion education program, and you probably went through these same milestones uh, or, or roadmap markers uh, along the way. Uh, so when I was interviewing recent graduates and, and trying to come up with uh, uh, what a student goes through today or in the last five years uh, to graduate, uh, uh, I, I used the, these buckets. Uh, uh, and it, 
These buckets also help us understand maybe some differences between perfusion education programs. So uh, pre-admission, these are all um, issues that perfusion students, uh, uh, candidates for perfusion education programs uh, must take into consideration. And if they have these things, uh, they'll maybe do better in the process of getting selected by a program. Who's your mentor? Have you ever seen open heart surgery? One of the effects of COVID uh, certainly has decreased the ability of, of uh, future perfusion education students, even getting near the OR, the ICU, to see what perfusionists do uh, in real life. Um, uh, thank gosh, there's uh, YouTube is alive and well. Uh, there's support groups uh, in Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and your preparation before your accomplishments before you come to perfusion to school might help you. It might help to be a registered nurse. It might be, help to be an RT, an EMT, a medical tech. Um, there's other uh, pre-professional uh, uh, licensed healthcare professionals that, that when I, we've had pharmacists uh, come to, uh, to perfusion school. How many programs will you apply to? Uh, interestingly, um, I put in capital letters what uh, the students or the recent graduates that I was talking to and the, the people two years out that I talked to, uh, they said it was hard to write a personal statement. The interview was difficult for them uh, because they don't know exactly what the perfusion education program is looking for when they're selecting students. Um, we don't all share our algorithms uh, or a selection process uh, with the interviewees. Um, uh, I don't think we do anyway. Um, that would be uh, something to hear from other program directors about. And uh, students have to generally relocate to a perfusion education program. Um, and that's a, a life event. Um, but I was, I was really surprised about uh, the interview and the personal statement and how difficult that may or may not be for, uh, for applicants. Uh, Pre-admission, uh, it helps to have a mentor. Uh, once you're enrolled, uh, which is a, a huge step, of course, um, and many programs have 10 or 20 applicants for each slot that they select. Uh, so it's very competitive right now. Um, and once you're enrolled, once you've matricul matriculated, who's your advisor? Um, and this is your academic advisor. Um, get to know your, uh, you have to get to know your uh, faculty role models. You want a faculty that is stable and credentialed. Uh, if you're in the middle of your perfusion education program and, and you're uh, fully invested in your tuition and your program director changes jobs or, or one of the important faculty members change jobs, your, uh, uh, I heard about those issues. Uh, in interviewing some of these two-year graduates. Um, you want to know that there's some kind of succession planning going on for faculty in the program. Um, you're struck with classmates who may have had a cardiac experience or an ICU experience, uh, might have been a perfusion assistant. Uh, it might make you feel uh, like um, uh, you're not as prepared as they are. Uh, or you might help each other. Um, there's a couple other milestones, um, uh, and that's uh, ceremonies, traditions. Uh, we have, and I'm sure other programs have a white coat ceremony uh, where uh, new enrollees are, uh, are taken into an arena, given a white coat, and they all say a healthcare professional's oath together. Of course, that oath is about the patient and about the team uh, and about your dedication to your profession. Um, those are important traditions. Then there's the didactic. Um, most, most of the, the students that I, the graduates that I talked to, I keep calling them students, I apologize for that, uh, said didactics were hard. The, the book learning was hard. Um, there are more people in class. The way classes are, are performed is changing. Uh, in perfusion education today, there should be less lecture 
and more class discussion and problem-based learning. Uh, lectures should start with, uh, just like at this meeting, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with patient situation and uh, patient uh, 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 challenges uh, to help the, the students understand uh, what it is we're trying to, to communicate today. There's many more standards of practice to teach from today uh, that the, the students are, are confronted with. Um, interestingly, uh, when I ask, you know, what's, the, what's the, the best thing or the best part of didactics or the most important part, most useful part, they said learning how to judge or evaluate evidence. Um, using the methodology that the ICEBP, the International Consortium for Evidence-Based Perfusion, and the other authors of the professional standards and guidelines, using those exact methods to come up with um, uh, recommendations and then the strength of those recommendations and then the level of the evidence supporting those recommendations, um, the students say that's very valuable to them uh, once they're out and in practice which I didn't appreciate uh, uh, when I'm sitting there going, well, what level of evidence is this? And how strong is this recommendation? And should we do it? And will you do it in your practice? Um, anyway, uh, they valued that uh, up on graduation. Um, the employers go, you got to teach these, these uh, folks how to, to problem solve and think critically. Um, that's hard to teach, but we certainly give them multiple opportunities. Uh, there is a consensus curriculum. There are standards and guidelines for accredited programs. Uh, our friends in the uh, AMSEC Pediatric and Congenital Committee have written a, uh, have authored a body of knowledge document uh, to help us with what we should be teaching in perfusion school. Clinicals. Um, <clears throat> where are your clinical preceptorships? Where are you going out to to do your clinicals or are you staying uh, in one place in one facility? Uh, are you going to multiple facilities? Um, uh, are your clinical assignments synchronous with your didactics? Um, programs as you, I'm sure you can realize, either do sequentially, they do their didactic, then they do their clinicals or phase slowly into the clinicals during didactics. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, perfusion students are in the OR or the ICU on the first day of their perfusion education program. Uh, in some programs, they, they don't get to run a hard lung machine until uh, the third, second or third semester of the program after didactics. Uh, some programs may have many hours of high fidelity perfusion simulation in a dedicated OR simulator uh, just for perfusion. Uh, or they might have less experience with simulators. There are high stakes step exam, high stakes competency checkoffs. Um, we need to make sure we cover team and non-technical skills training. We'll hear more about that from, from David. Uh, your classmates become your teammates. Um, and it's, it's interesting, we keep talking about when you join a heart team, when you join a... Uh, uh, when you get out in an ICU and you're working on a team of uh, caregivers and, and what we try to do in our program and other programs try to do is, is you have a team now of your classmates and it's a great chance to practice a uh, team. I'm gonna break away here for a second and, and share a principle that, uh, that just fascinates me. Um, surgical performance and risk to the patient um, and this, I'll just be frank, this drives SUNY program a lot. Uh, you know, what's the cost of learning on live patients or on live uh, perfusion uh, uh, clinical faculty? Uh, there's, there's this time where you're in training and something happens before you go into surgery actually, uh, and you're developing your performance, your ability to run the heart lung machine. And at some point you go into surgery the Halstead model from several decades ago was you, you gain these, the surgical performance running the heart lung machine in our case, um, while you're actually in surgery with our human clients, uh, 
with a mentor over your shoulder, a preceptor over your shoulder watching. And the risk to the patient uh, is high. Um, there's a the chance that 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 student might distract uh, uh, or uh, do something that isn't caught necessarily or or uh, amended by the uh, uh, the, per, the clinical faculty. Um, and of course, the the more proficient, uh, competent uh, the learner, the student becomes, uh, the lower the um, the risk to the patient. What what the uh, simulation model does is there's a lot of simulation, a lot of attainment of, of skills and competencies before you go into actual surgery. And we and others want our students to appear the first day in surgery, <clears throat> other than observation, but for their clinical uh, uh, rotations, we want them to appear like they're a second or a third rotation student, not a first rotation student. And uh, we have, um, uh, uh, we believe that that decreases the, the risks and the distractions uh, to, uh, to the clinical faculty. Um, I'm so happy to share with you that our program director, Bruce Searles, is now a PhD. And this is one of the outcomes of, of Bruce's 10 years or plus of research into simulation uh, and perfusion and, and ECMO. Uh, and he actually quantitated uh, this decrease in risk or potential decrease in risk uh, to patients. And, and I look forward to his thesis being published. Uh, but we can call him Dr. Searles now. Congratulations, Bruce. Um, then comes graduation, finally. Uh, did you complete a thesis or a capstone project? Uh, there's this point that, that a lot of perfusion students don't quite understand that there's this one piece of paper. And I always felt really powerful as a program director, and Al can share in this probably too, where you're sitting there looking at this piece of paper for the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, uh, the certification group, and you're going to sign off that this uh, uh, perfusion graduate is competent. They're safe and they're competent. A single piece of paper. They have their degree. They're, they've earned their degree from your, your institution, but there's still this one piece of paper that gets signed by your program director. Uh, you have to find an employment opportunity. You probably have to relocate again. You have to orient to a new job, which is more competency checkoffs. You have to review for and pass the American board exams. There are other micro certification exams to master uh, if you choose to. And then your employer at the end of a year gives feedback to the perfusion education program. And that becomes part of the outcomes that the program director has to report to the accreditation committee for perfusion education. Whew. That's a circle. Uh, Postgraduate gets more fun. Uh, you're trying to figure out if you're going to pay dues to professional organizations or pay your school loans off. Uh, you are forced into multidisciplinary gatherings and teams, uh, conferences. There's a lot going on online. Uh, there's so much available online. Uh, webinar after webinar, which is wonderful. Uh, publications, uh, keeping up with the, the literature, being a lifelong learner. Um, simulation, more competency checkoffs, uh, and then you have to start thinking about recertification. And then you're faced with opportunities for promotion. And you hope that what you did in school will prepare you for management opportunities and teaching opportunities. And I would submit that that's the life of a, uh, the current experience of a perfusion student uh, and some path along that way. Lifestyle has changed that requires dedication and flexibility, advantage to adopt mentors and guides, numerous resources are available, numerous competency checkoffs along the way. Your program director is influential in your life. And I'll tell you, I admire perfusion students. They are extraordinary. Um, if I am smart at all, it's because I've been surrounded by so many brilliant students who just, never failed to teach me something new every day or if not every hour. Um, and I can't tell you enough about that. 
So off to the, the second part of, of my assignment. Um, uh, who is this program director person? Um, well, program directors set the tone for the program. They set the culture, they set the celebrations, the traditions, they guard all of those, uh, those uh, milestones. They set the value system. And the way they set it is how they act. Um, they are role models. Um, they are watched uh, with ego eyes by how many students are in front of them. Uh, they decide what's taught along with the accreditation committee for profusion education, but they actually make sure what gets caught gets caught. And they see the future. They're very powerful. Um, they meet as a group. It's called the Profusion Program Directors Council. Um, I'll be critical of the council. Uh, you can't find a website uh, anymore. You, you can't find a list of programs and potential future programs. Um, one of the, I think one of the few lists and my search came up on profusion.com. Um, program rejectors report, in a sense, to the Accreditation Committee for Profusion Education. Uh, they offer the standards and guidelines for accredited profusion education programs. They have the approved curriculum. Um, here, I guess we could find an accredited program here, um, but that isn't what popped up. I have here the standards and guidelines to show you and you can see that they were amended in 2019. And these are the organizations who send representatives to the to KHEP to form the ACPE to monitor and amend the standards and guidelines and to, uh, uh, to work on the um, um, and to work on the, uh, the consensus curriculum. And here is the Profusion Program Directors Council. And um, so in order to talk about the second part here, I started calling Profusion Program Directors and asking them about the future. And that was kind of fun because um, I can sit here in my retired program director position uh, and I'm sure Al can too as a, as a past program director and tell the program director council and give them advice and, uh, and help them see the future, but uh, that's not how it works. Uh, I think it's gonna be determined by the program directors. Uh, so everything I'm gonna present in these next slides came out of the mouths of program directors. Um, and uh, uh, I asked some questions uh, to get them to say some of these things. Uh, is distal virtual learning here to stay? Yes, it's here to stay. Uh, one of the smart answers I got uh, was that we use web-based meeting, meetings as a tool, an educational tool. Uh, even though the COVID environment in most universities have forced us into uh, social distancing and not meeting in classrooms and meeting online, um, uh, now uh, if we come out of this, out of these uh, uh, quarantines and uh, and people are uh, healthier, uh, it can become more of a tool rather than an absolute necessity. Uh, United States programs are gonna affiliate and cooperate with outside of the US, OUS, perfusion education programs. Um, there's a lot going on in this area that we'll hear about. US programs are admitting foreign students at a distance, uh, and that's made possible by these web-based tools. And then some of the research that uh, I've been doing and others, is can online simulation be equivalent to face-to-face -to -face simulation training? Can you teach skills online? Um, and um, we hope to uh, submit a manuscript uh, here recently on uh, that we've finished recently on that. Uh, US will graduate more perfusionists from more programs. Um, the United States um, will increase the number of programs. There are rumors that there's five new programs out there. There's rumors that two programs are closing uh, and a third perhaps. Uh, but the bottom line is that programs will produce more graduates. And there's more recently, there seems to be more support by industry and by contract perfusion groups uh, of perfusion education programs. Succession planning is needed. 
what does the future hold? Faculty burnout with COVID-19 uh, is, is alive and well, just like uh, frontline caregiver uh, burnout. Um, and for many programs, especially the startup programs, uh, it's reported that there's a shortage of experienced faculty and qualified program directors. But it's really interesting, not all programs <clears throat> uh, feel this way, and they feel like they have a funnel of their own graduates that uh, of candidates with PhDs that could come back and direct their programs. Uh, so there was a varied uh, mixed response to this. Classes should not be canceled because the professor has been up all night in the OR and the ICU. And one program director uh, thought we should recruit PhDs to current perfusion education programs. And with the salaries and opportunities and, and clinical opportunities, there probably are research PhDs out there, physiologists and others who might find perfusion education challenging. Um, part of the, <clears throat> the challenge of this is there's a potential lack of rigor in perfusion education programs. Uh, some program directors are critical of other programs that, that just don't meet classes when they're supposed to and don't teach what they're supposed to. This potential lack of rigor. Um, uh, and once a programs grow into a certain size, uh, it's hard to decrease the number of uh, candidates in that, in that program, decrease the number of, of folks um, in the program. CCPs are working outside of cardiac surgeons. That's a big deal. Um, we aren't just reporting to cardiac surgeons anymore. We're working for other types of surgeons in other care areas doing other non-cardiac procedures. And the antithesis of that is non-perfusionists are doing perfusion activities, especially our friendly procedure, ECMO procedures. Um, program directors know that uh, graduates have to be ECMO ready now. As a matter of fact, um, uh, clinicians are calling uh, perfusion education programs and asking if their students can come and rotate through their ICUs and be an extra help a hand, an extra pair of hands and help. Um, and uh, here comes that informatics, electric, uh, electronic perfusion records. Uh, and the whole idea of uh, teaching uh, quality improvement uh, processes like we've heard this morning. Another theme was simulation learning is being joined with preclinical education. We're combining simulation and didactics uh, before uh, students get into, uh, into the, uh, the clinic, although this, this is just starting to get traction probably uh, amongst a number of programs. Perfusion educators are having to become simulation specialists and facilitators. Uh, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion is recognizing high fidelity perfusion simulation facilities. Um, I believe there's four or five perfusion education programs who have taken the time to register and be recognized by the American Board. They're not certifying them or crediting them, they're recognizing them. Um, and this lets, the when you're working in, in simulation, it's it might be easier to tie in electronic perfusion records and, and the use of those records. Um, one program director um, and, and probably a second program director um, pointed out that we need to teach perfusion graduates how to work in the healthcare industry today and how the healthcare industry is changing. And that comes back to team training. Uh, uh, I guess you could call this one non-technical skill, uh, uh, perhaps uh, how to work in the healthcare industry. And there's so many innovations and so many opportunities and it's so expensive um, uh, that it's, and it's also, uh, it's like any other uh, discipline, uh, uh, it can be studied and, and taught and shared. And uh, this was probably the most controversial thing. Um, when, you, when you think about the fact that perfusion program directors report back to, uh, in a sense, to the Accreditation Committee for Perfusion Education, um, uh, there was uh, 
the expression that who's uh, who's steering the ACPE ship? Uh, does the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion perhaps too much have, have too much influence? That sounds political. Uh, shouldn't the PPDC members decide what is taught in perfusion education? And one director said there ought to be a data-driven evidence-based process run by educators, educators to identify and teach um, what they do with, with uh, uh, graduate medical students uh, going off to their um, residencies. Uh, and that's to come up with entrustable professional activities for perfusion graduates. This is a whole uh, interesting way of looking at uh, what you expect uh, perfusion graduates to be able to do uh, either before they go into the clinic or before they graduate. Um, and uh, there was some feedback that the standards and guidelines from the accreditation committee need to define what, uh, what research is for MS level perfusion degrees. Um, so if we bring these all together, are you ready, Al? Um, more classmates, more online coursework, more competition for jobs, more high fidelity extracorporeal simulation, more practice outside cardiac surgery, more thesis proposals, hopefully more publications. Uh, our journal editor would love that. More team and non-technical skills training. And I'm just gonna lay it out there that the PPDC must rise up. They need to get organized. And I think they're one of the most powerful groups um, uh, and could be the most powerful. We need to see more white papers. We need uh, for them to tell us uh, what they need. Um, and then the other thing I wanna point out uh, that I learned from talking with, there's different, I'm sorry, that's not right. There's different levels of, of different stages of professional maturity and growth amongst PE programs, their faculty and their directors. Um, so that even makes the PPDC more important. The more mature programs uh, and the experienced directors can help the, the new young programs. Thank you very much for your attention.